Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, I think some of our colleagues do have questions. Uh, I'll start with one. Uh, we're here looking for information to help us to address this propaganda war. Uh, one of those issues is the information about any Australians that have been captured, uh, any admissions they may have made about who is funding them, how they've come here, also to draw attention to the mercenary nature of this, uh, this process with, with, with foreign fighters. The other one that I'd like to ask is to do with Geneva because I think we will have some opportunities back at home in the next few weeks when we go home to break through this media blockade and, and have a voice in, in support of Syria uh, about Geneva. Um, uh, I wonder if there's any particular themes you think are particularly important for us to raise. And at the same time, I'm also thinking what you mentioned about the article there about Saudi Arabia going it alone. Now, um, in my understanding of things, uh, with all of the weapons that they buy with the unlimited money that they have, there is always a, a condition of contract when the US sells weapons that they can't re-export those weapons without permission. Yeah. So to what extent is this a, a new game, a plan B, that now the US it wants to keep Dr. Bashar to, against Jabhat al-Nusra and the Saudis are running some independent policy? To what extent is there any real independence between Washington and and Saudi Arabia. I don't mean in diplomatic language, because in diplomatic language we have to yeah, persist I know. with the... I know. But what, what is this... Is there a plan B here? Because it's impossible for me to imagine that Washington does not understand... Exactly. Uh, I does not know. Mm. What, uh, this is the one million dollar question I would love to know. Mm. You know, I would love to know whether the United States is just doing a double standard show. On the one hand, agreeing with the Russians and that we want to go to Geneva. On the other hand, blind eye to Saudi Arabia and let Saudi Arabia fight. I think my own personal analysis is that they are hoping that by the time Geneva is convened, the terrorists will have more ground or will have you know, a stronger uh, position so that they are in a stronger position to negotiate in Geneva against the government. I think this might be the, the deal between Saudi Arabia and the United States, which, uh, because now they, there's no way they can see a legitimate way to remove President Assad by force. So they are, they are trying to use the Saudis and these terrorists, but I find it incredible that, that the United States finds itself on the same line with, with these terrorists, you know, with these horrible terrorists. And I think it's shameful that the United States should support uh, a, a government like Saudi Arabia. I, th I think it's disgraceful, really, like Bandar al Sultan. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I think this is a kind of hypocrisy uh, that is there, but they, they're using it, you know, in order yeah. to see how strong is the regime, how, uh, when it arrives to Geneva, uh, could it be weaker? I think they are trying to weaken the regime. They didn't dream that it would last, you know, so long. Uh, but, but now that they can't get rid of it, I think they are trying to weaken it. Yeah. You know? I, I think that's just my personal yes. analysis, but my guess, but I have no, yes. no information. If, uh, did you ask the Professor Mukdad about an Australian who yes. probably has been captured? Yeah, uh, my colleague is saying that uh, the Minister of Information told you that there is a list of names, Australians, who are fighting in the war on Syria, and uh, that uh, you might be able to get some of these names. Uh, how long are they saying? in regards to the names of uh, you have uh, asked me to report it to the Australian public 
the name actually woke up a few names. Is there any specific name you asked? Well, the, it was the Prime Minister who said that um, uh, that uh, the National Security Office had uh, a list of Australian names that they verified as being killed, not captured, killed. Yeah. Um, and the uh, Information Minister uh, um, said that um, uh, uh, that he would arrange, or we would arrange, uh, meetings with uh, uh, jailed foreign fighters, but he wasn't specific about the nationality. And the Deputy Foreign Minister said that um, uh, that uh, the inquiries could be made on our behalf about whether any Australians were in prison or not. We have one name that Syria gave to the UN Security Council in uh, uh, 2012. <laughs> 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 Ahmed Kakoni, and yeah. they, he, the United Nations, not United Nations, Human Rights, said, uh, claiming he was selling falafel and how did you capture it? And coming from Australia, a poor guy to sell falafel in the Rhine hotspot area. Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's the only name that we have. Uh, there have been, uh, there was a, um, do you want to mention the Venezuelan? A Venezuelan example? member of parliament was here for some time and mm -hmm. Uh, uh, he's gone home now, but he, he said there were two Australians held. They had made admissions about how much they had been paid, between twenty and $40,000 to come to Syria, uh, and that they had uh, some atrocities on their phone, so that they, they had spoken about that. Um, uh, doctor, you may know that, you may or may not know that the current government, we've had a change of government, um, has arrested two people just in the last two weeks. Yeah, I know. One yeah. for organising uh, financing and one yeah. for about to travel. They've cancelled about another 20 passports. So there's the beginning of some movement yeah. there yeah. after many months of inaction, of course. Yeah. Um, but it is what is important to us is quite specific. We know that the Saudi money has been used in Australia for some time, but the specific details of who and where uh, is it important for us to put it on the criminal perspective? Yeah. I think, I really believe what, what I would suggest is that, that we, you decide who on the delegation would be the contact person. Mm -hmm. And I would have a contact person from my office because mm -hmm. this might take time. I, yes. I'm, you know, I will try my best. It doesn't yeah. mean that I will not try my best the moment I go out of this door. Mm -hmm. I will, but I, I can't promise you know, how fast I can get mm -hmm. information. And then I think after your visit, it's good to establish contact so mm -hmm. that you might have other questions or you might have mm -hmm. other issues yes. so that we will be in touch and we will be yes. able to, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. convey to you what we have in all honesty and then you decide how you are going to use it or okay. not use it or, yes. or whatever. Yes. So I will ask the National Security Office about names of Australians. Mm -hmm. And I think most countries in Europe, they have been saying that there are 200, 300, 400, you know, 200 from Germany, 300 from Britain. I'm sure there are many uh, uh, people. We have, we have 83 nationalities, unfortunately, uh, of those who are fighting uh, against our army and our people. So we would love to raise awareness in, yes. in Australia and in the West about the danger of these people, because yes. I think these people don't care whether they are killing an Australian or a Syrian or whatever, you know, a killer is a killer. <laughs> that, that's it. So we would love to cooperate with you okay. uh, on that scale. And I, I would volunteer my office to be in, in touch with you and to okay. let you know and to be in touch. And Nizar Kwebo is my assistant okay. sitting there. He can, uh, he can give you his email and you give him your email and uh, uh, we will definitely follow up on, on the issue. Thank you. Some of us are here, uh, we go to Lataki, but we come back and we'll be here a little bit longer. So yeah, okay. That's We're going to Lataki? Yes, yeah. we're going to Lataki for a few days to, yeah. to visit the... Well, let us hope that I will, I will have uh, you know, a few things for you okay. when you come back. I mean, as I said, then we we'll Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, uh, Elam, uh, from one of the members from Hands Off Syria in our group, yeah. has a question for you. Yeah, Hi, please. how are you? Um, we've heard from the beginning of the crisis that um, President Dr. Bashar Assad um, is not very loved here. 
and we witnessed a lot of very big numbered rallies in the heart of Damascus, yeah. showing the support of the president and the government. Yeah. And the mainstream media back home actually was saying that these were government employees and they were sent down forcefully and members of his family and whatnot, and we all know that yeah. that is not true. But um, do you think that the president, and they're also now saying that the president will not run for election in 2014. So, do you, is he going to run for election in 2014? And I think that, can you explain to me what the Syrian people's reaction would be if he doesn't? Well, I think uh, I will use the president's words, you know, in his um, interviews. He said, if the Syrian people would like me to run for uh, the president, I will. But if they don't, I won't. I will be, you know, I will express the will of the Syrian people. But in his last interviews, he said, I can't see why not. Uh, why, why don't I run for a president? He's a Syrian citizen. He has to, the right to uh, run for a president. I think, you know, I'm his advisor, and therefore, it, you know, you should probably ask somebody else, but probably in Latakia, stop with somebody on the street and ask them. I encourage you to do that. Stop anywhere and ask people, what do you think? You would, would you like President Assad to stay as president? Would you vote for President Assad? And you will see that the majority of the Syrian people will say to you, we will. Because it, it, this war, it's not against him. It's against Syria, and it's against the stand of Syria as you know, anti-imperial, as a resistance country who, who resisted the Israeli uh, hegemony over our land, uh, who stood with the Palestinian rights. When I went to Australia, I gave lectures at university, and I showed what Israel did in 2006. And people cried. I know. And, and, and you know, it was August 2006. I went immediately after the end of the Israeli war on Lebanon. And it was horrifying what Israel did to Lebanon, and of course we stood with Lebanon, and Lebanese people, 500,000, came to Syria, and so all all the Syrian stands throughout, you know, the region, whether against the war on Iraq, against the aggression on Iraq, or against the war on Lebanon, or against the war on Gaza, they, they want to end Syria as a country to be able to, to take uh, such a stand, you know. So I believe the president will uh, be a candidate. And uh, let the Syrian people decide. I mean, it's up to the Syrian people. I don't know what democracy it is to formulate a government in Geneva. You know, I don't know whether this is the kind of democracy that the world wants. And second, what would you do in Australia, God forbid, if you have an opposition that is carrying arms, destroying your factories, destroying your schools, butchering people. Is there any kind of opposition like this in the world? And the West still refers to them as opposition, as armed opposition. Is there an armed opposition or opposition should be political? You know, I, I don't know why, why this concept applies to Syria, but it doesn't apply anywhere else in the world. When, when few men tried to make havoc in London, uh, Cameron said, we will, you know, we will, not, we, will, we will use every single method to get rid of them. And he's right, because he and wants he peace, security to his country. Nobody blamed him. Uh, how, how these people are considered in the eyes of the West as people who are calling for political change. Let us end this terrorism. Let us end this you know, armed gun. And then let us have a very democratic, plural, political process. We are for it. We are all for it. So, uh, Dr. Um, our colleague Jamal Daud has a, has a question for you. It's all related to the question of the, people, the Australians who, will be, who were killed in Syria. Mm -hmm. Lately, like last month, the boss of ASIO, the security intelligence, admitted about six who were killed fighting with terrorists. So this is the first time they admitted. We provided them the names of the of the of these people, so we have the names of, of, this, of, of, of Australians, of Australians, six Australians, we are interested, I am, and my group interested in new names, other names, because the five, uh, the five, and the six people, we have the names, we want to explore if you have more information, more names, because we know that they admitted that there is six people who were killed fighting with the Muslims, 
with names that we provided them and we know the name of somebody who, who's in jail. We were wondering if we can meet with this guy because... What's his name? Uh, Ahmed Gakun. Yeah, Khair Ahmed Gakun. That's all. And you said six names. Six names who were killed. Okay. With now Mustafa Mizou. Mustafa Mizou. Yeah. And... Uh, Raja Abbas. It's been published in the, in the media. They're all from Arab origin? No. No. There's one Turkish. Sam uh, Salman. Uh, but these ones have been published already in the media, the ones killed. Yeah. Uh, we are interested in the people who will talk and talk about who has been paying them in our country. Exactly. The paymasters. That's very important. Yeah. The paymasters. Uh -huh. Because those people really understand nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yesterday they showed uh, on our television, I wish you can take it, uh, those who killed the booty. Yeah, actually, I did ask if they don't do Please that. take the CD no, no, with you. Muhammad died Ramadan al Guti. You know, uh, one person said I reach uh, baccalaurea. You know, they are young people who understand nothing. You know, and uh, one of them who was going the, the suicidal, who was going to to uh, uh, kill al Guti, the suicide belt. Um, he said to them, why in the mosque? You know, is it okay if I kill him in the mosque? Or why not on the road? They said to him, no, no, some sheikh said it's okay. He said, well, if he said it's okay, it's okay. I mean, they understand nothing about Islam. It has nothing to do with Islam. It's, it's totally against Islam. God said, anyone who kills one human soul in the Quran, as if he killed the entire humanity, this is Islam, you know, they, I am a Muslim woman, I read the Quran, I know what the Quran has. If, if you kill one human soul, as if you have killed the entire humanity, and God said even if you destroy the Kaaba, one stone after another, is easier for God than spelling one spot of blood of a human being. Human life is the most important thing to preserve and keep. So these people, I, I believe this is also done against Islam because it distorts the image of Islam in the eyes of people who are far away and who do not know what Islam is. They might believe that this is what Islam, you know, allows, which is not true, of course. Yes, uh, so we, I, I, I am one of the people who is interested in knowing the, admit, the admission of the, like, what they admitted this guy who was in jail. Yeah who facilitated his travel to Australia because the mood is changing in Australia and we we might stop these people and and enforce the intelligence agency to act against we know many organizations but we don't have evidence yeah. that they are I think doing you should this. see this guy who is in jail yeah. Yes, this is yeah, the only point. Yeah, We're I ready to interview him and take it back yeah, for television. I think that would be good yes. if you can interview him and yes. then so show it on your television. That's what I understood yeah. your co your contact was yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm the one who is trying to decide. What's his name? Ahmed Kakuni. Ahmed Kakuni. Ahmed Kakuni. Ahmed Kakuni. Or anyone else. Who yeah, yeah, or anyone. Anyone, anyone, Australian, yeah, I mean Australia, anyone who's been Australia, please. But at least yeah. this you know, he's he's in jail, so yes. uh, you mm. know you could meet him and then we could ask for if there are more. Doctor, uh, our colleague, another colleague from Hands Off Syria, Jasmine Sadat, has a has a question. Yeah, please. Hi, um, you were speaking earlier about, um, I guess, like the black market that's arisen in terms of like a sex trade or you know the selling What is the Syrian government doing to counter that? Because we have read a lot of reports on that. Um, what role is the government trying to stop it? I didn't understand really what the question. I didn't hear you properly. Just speak um, Just say it louder. Sorry. Um, you were speaking earlier about how you know there's been the selling of of humans. There's yeah. Been, yeah. Women. Yeah. Of women. Yeah. yeah. Um, my question is, what is the Syrian, like, we've read heaps of reports on it, and that's information that we try and share to the Australian public as well to make them aware of it, um, of some of the things that are going on in Syria. But uh, what role has the Syrian government played uh, to try to help stop this or to help these people? Yeah, well, well we are trying, you know, these people actually, to your information, would like to come back. And we are trying to make countries and you, uh, United Nations intervene so that Jordan and Turkey would allow them to come back. Actually, they are not allowed to come back. They are not allowed to leave the camps in which they are. 
uh, you know, they, there are six million displaced people inside Syria, but we do not have camps for these people. We have houses, we have schools, we have centers, we have, we are trying our best so that they have at least the minimal human dignity. But those are not actually refugees. They are arrested in, in these countries because they are not allowed to come back. And we are, we are asking every country to intervene. We are asking the UN to intervene. They don't allow them. If you, if you read some, you know, what, what has been published in the Sunday Times and in some newspapers where journalists went there, they don't allow them like to go to Amman or they don't like, allow them to leave the camp. They are actually hostages in that camp, and they are being manipulated and used by authorities. And in the meantime, these authorities are asking the UN for money to, the, you know, to pay for these people. It's, it's the ultimate hypocrisy. I would also like to remind you that in 2011, when Turkey put tents on the border, there was not a single Syrian refugee there. Not a single Syrian refugee. They put the tents prepared a camp for Syrian refugees that they came and paid from Idlib and from Aleppo. They were paying them money every day, $100 for a person if you depart, if you leave. As my friend here said, ask for the paymaster because that's the one who is, you know, who's running the show. It's not these poor people who are being just used and manipulated. We are trying through religious authorities, through UN authorities, through raising consciousness, through uh, NGOs, to try and encourage these people to come back to Syria. But the countries, Jordan and, and Turkey in particular, are not allowing anybody to leave their camps or to come back to Syria. So what can you do? That's the problem. Dr. Uh, John Shipton, I believe, has a, has a question for you. How's your son first? Uh, he's, he's okay. Good. Okay. I know that he's in the embassy of the Peru he, he in London. No, this is the freedom of uh, speech yeah, and the freedom, you know, this freedom. is the free media, yeah? Say what you want. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, just, uh, uh, this is probably the wrong forum to, to address these matters, but um, with uh, Syria and other countries being forced into the name of democracy and uh, their being forced to shape their governments in, in, in within these forms of what we call democracy, general representative government. Um, and the, over the last 10 years, it's clear that the, the democracies have become failures, and those countries that are succeeding uh, have other form of administration. Yeah. Um, and the second part is that uh, we see in Egypt and the Ukraine an elected government uh, makes a decision, or is elected, and then makes a decision. And then uh, the, the crowds all them gather and demand that that government, which I just elected, go. Yeah. And this is, uh, seems to be uh, not democracy, but the representative government democracy. Um, and uh, the function of democracy as it's appearing now seems to be making uh, countries ungovernable rather than government. Um, and the ability of uh, financiers to buy up newspaper outlets and uh, cause a change of atmosphere in a country which just doesn't benefit the country and establish NGOs which are all fake yeah. and uh, the, this it seems to be accompanied by the manufacture of ex as extremists, right from the Malaysian archipelago right through to to Syria, the manufacture of yeah. Syria uh, of terrorists. Yeah. The Gulen is the, the, the organisation is is Turkish. You know, yeah. They manufacture these yeah. uh, extremists, and then uh, in the yeah. in the uh, 
then the Saudi finances, yeah, exactly. the terrorist, and then there has to be organizational growth, because in selling, it's a NATO base. So Saudi doesn't have the organizational depth to utilize in selling. So that requires NATO and the USA. Yeah. So these, these are uh, things, you know, that I like to address uh, in this fashion, you know, the, the strategies of these people be exposed so that yeah. movement, so that governments can yeah. anticipate yeah. and reform their administrations to account for NGOs who are actually mm -hmm. smart. Yeah. Sorry, I've gone on a little bit. Yeah. Forgive me. Well, I, I, I really take your points. I think this is very good comments. But I think I would like I would like to add to it that I feel, you know, as an Arab woman, that uh, what is happening in the region and in the world now is really a historical process. What has distinguished the West in the last 10 years, unfortunately, is the hypocritical stance, saying one thing and doing another, and you know, uh, never really saying the truth. I think what what has brought Re Russia now to become one of the major powers is the sincerity and the truthfulness of what they've been saying. I mean, I, as a Syrian woman, from the beginning of this crisis until now, Lavrov and Putin had been having the same stand, saying the same thing, sticking to the same ethic, you know? So uh, I feel that, uh, um, I mean, uh, also democracy, even, you know, if we want to make democracy in Syria or plural <coughs> or whatever, who said that we want to be a copy of the United States? Who said that we want liberal democracy? Who said that, that, that the life in the United States of people is something that we like or admire. My daughter lives in Tampa in the United States and she's now with me over Christmas. And she said to me, we Arab women are queens compared with the, with, the, okay. with the horrible life that American women are living. They are struggling all the time. They, they, have, uh, you know, they have no support, they have no family support, they have no neighbor support, they have no social circle. It, it's horrible, it, it's horrible. Uh, so, so we would like to have our own democracy that is appropriate to our culture, to our way of life, to our history. You know, uh, we 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 no longer see the West, unfortunately, as an example. We don't. So uh, we don't have to see. <laughs> you know, you know, we we don't have to see the West as, as an example. So I think Turkey. Uh, I mean, Turkey is having now big problems now yes, also, yes, you know, and uh, uh, so at the end, I, I mean, I remember, you know, look at the difference between Turkey and Malaysia, for example. I remember Mahathir Mohammed oh, came here, and very immense, came here and, and gave a, a talk in 2005, and he said, you know, he explained the experience of Malaysia and how, you know, it, he, he brought Malaysia up to, to have this economic stand. And he said, but once we dealt with Malaysia, we felt that we can't be a booming country, a prosperous country, if our neighbors are poor. So we started to help our neighbors to be prosperous, because with whom are you going to trade? You have to have prosperous neighbors in order to trade. While Turkey, while having a country like Syria, we opened our borders we, you know, at the expense of our own industries. And, and, and it made itself a... A, a, a path for terrorists to come to Syria who are now going back to Turkey. And it's, in the next two, three years, Turkey is going to have big problems. And so would Saudi Arabia, I hope, and, and the Gulf states. So we get rid of all this system and we have a, a proper system uh, in the Arab world. I feel that the Arab world is passing through the stage that Latin America passed through 30 or 40 years ago. This, These are, you know, this is the beginning of awareness of Arab people to, to build their countries, to mold, uh, to, to, to be Arabs, you know, not to be Asians to the US or Britain or, or whatever. I, I feel this is the beginning of, of true life. Doctor, we have one. You have, you have meeting. We have one more question from, from Reem Saka. Yeah, please. 
feel? Um, I just wanted, uh, it was just a follow-up question to the question that my colleague Jasmine asked. Um, you said that the refugees uh, who are in camps outside of Syria are basically prisoners and those yeah. in Turkey and Jordan are not allowed to come back. Um, we also know that there are even uh, more internally displaced people inside Syria That's and important. they are living in houses and uh, yeah. being provided for by the Syrian government, not in camps like in no. Jordan. Mm -hmm. But why did these refugees leave Syria in the first place? What would make a Syrian citizen leave the country, go into a foreign country instead of just uh, going to another province mm. or staying inside yeah. of Syria? Yeah, well, that, that's a very good question which we asked really early on, as I said, in the crisis when they started to go from Adlib. You know, there are some families of armed people who were also bribed and convinced to go to, to Turkey. This is one, one way to leave the country. The second way to leave the country, you know, if you are living in a very, uh, you know, hot area where fighting is going on all the time <coughs> and you can't get to home, it's easier. And most people in Turkey are people, you know, we have 800 kilometers borders with Turkey. So you have rural Aleppo, rural Idlib, you know, the rural uh, Hasake and Khamishli are closer to Turkey, are 10 kilometers from Turkey, while they are uh, 150 kilometers from any new, any town, any Syrian town. So geographic proximity plays a part. Now you see the refugees in Jordan are mostly from Dara because it is a, a, a you know a border area, or in Lebanon are mostly from Tel Kelah or Houle because they can cross the, to to Lebanon. So this is what what makes them go. As I said, there are two types: either families of armed people who are afraid you know, to stay here so they would leave so that their children can fight uh, as much as they like, or they are bribed to go, or they are actually fleeing a, a hot area with the clashes for safety and, and fleeing to the next point, whether it's inside Jordan or inside there. This, this is what I can think of, really. But we, we have almost six million displaced in Syria. Yes. And, and, you know, if these refugees stayed in Syria, definitely they would have been much better off. Exactly. At least their, their integrity would have been preserved. And uh, we have NGOs, we have the government, everybody is working to try and bring them back. But it is a political decision on the part of this country not to allow them back. Yes. Doctor, we do have one more quick question from Gail Malone here. Yeah, please. I'd like to personally convey my sorrow for what's happening to the Syrian people. I've been involved with a lot of people in war zones and I understand how much the children suffer. Uh, I part of charities that uh, simple I would from Afghanistan to the internal refugee camps because babies uh, freezing to death over winter, so I'm concerned about the children with colder weather coming. Uh, I understand that 80% of most aid is like a dog and doesn't get to people. Uh, I would like to visit some of you if I could and try and work out how best we could help with our large reach and my personal connections. Um, to visit where? Orphanage. It's my belief that God has no harsh no enough mm -hmm. for those that spill the blood of the children, but also those that spill the blood of the children's parents yeah. and leave those children around. Yeah. I don't know who in the Latin we don't visit the space. In Latakia yeah, we don't visit we've got in our program uh, displaced uh, camps. In Latakia. Yeah. yeah. We've got maybe two visits over there. I think the person who's, you know, either from the Ministry of Higher Education or can take that on, and uh, but when, when you are in Latakia, either you visit orphanage in Latakia or you visit orphanage in Damascus, I don't think that's a problem at all. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for all your efforts. Well, thank you very much. I know you have. As we finish, we have a little gift for you, just as well, a token of our esteem from much. from well, Jasmine. Your presence here is a gift, no, really. Thank you. Thank you. You're saying it's very a big present Thank you very much. Well, I. Uh, 
I saw the kangaroo in Australia and I really had a great time. Really oh, great. I said that before the <laughs> Thank you. On behalf of the Australian delegation, in solidarity with Syria, I'd like much. to thank you for your time. Thank it's been you. an absolute honour to be thank invited you. as guests. I'm really honoured and delighted. Thank you very much. I'd like to present you with this uh, Aboriginal craft. Thank you. Uh, it's hand painted by some Aboriginal artists. Uh, it's got a little Love stand the and there's a box that you can put oh, it in. Thank you so much. You know, I have a painting from nice the Aborigines. I love them. I want to go back to Australia to see some <laughs> more Aborigines. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.